y'all can see the topic for the day is the introvert Israelite. All right. This officer Raphael told me that somebody had asked him uh, to do a class on that or whatever, something like that. And uh, I was like, yeah, that's a good idea because a lot of people, um, like in the world today, that term has become kind of popular. Um, some people kind of like glory in an idea or kind of like have taken some type of pride in that title. Like, yeah, I'm an introvert. Yeah. And uh, whatever. Um, and of course, uh, you could say it's a general negative connotation to it in, in terms of, you know, interaction within the world. Like, to be an introvert is not necessarily a good thing. But like I said, some people have grown to embrace it. Uh, and in its truth, some people may feel like, you know, um, in the world, I wore that title. I knew I was an introvert. And it's truth, you know, I still, you know, feel those same type of feelings or whatever. And I don't really know if that's right. I don't really know if that's in the spirit to still hold the title as an introvert. Like, can I be an Israelite and an introvert at the same time? Or is that wrong? All right. So we're going to deal with the scriptures this morning and Lord's willing, man, brothers and sisters get edified. Now listen, and I'm going to cover this in the beginning of the class. If that ain't your problem, you know what I'm saying? If you don't deal with that, like Bishop say, you know, it's water off a duck's back. <laughs> it don't apply to you. Uh, but for my brothers and sisters that deal, you may deal with social anxiety or you may deal with... Uh, you know, you just like being to yourself. Uh, you're not a big fan of, you know, just being in a huge crowd around a whole bunch of people and stuff like that. And you just, uh, you know, you, you uh, what's the word? You value quality time with yourself, you know? I got a lot of brothers and sisters like that. So this is going to be for y'all. This is going to be a good examination of your spirit. And what you uh, what you need to do, all right? I'm gonna open up with Hebrews chapter twelve and verse nine. Hebrews chapter twelve and verse nine. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hebrews twelve verse nine. It says, "Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence." Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? All right. So the Bible calls the Most High God the Father of spirits. Um, meaning what? We, of course, we are walking in this flesh. And in the world, of course, we measure things according to the flesh. But we understand that the, the spiritual aspect of all of our lives is the most important because when a person die you know until they body the care or whatever they are a carcass they are still their body their fleshly body is still there the skin the bones all the muscles that still exist but without the spirit within that body without that physical vessel that physical vessel is nothing right so the spirits within us is what determines the type of person that we actually are. That goes into our character, um, you know what I'm saying, our traits, our attributes, things of that nature. That depends on your spirit. And God is the father of spirits, meaning he made different types of spirits. Not everybody got the same type of spirit. Like I said, some people don't struggle with no type of introvert issues or problems they they pe they're a people person they love talking in front of a lot of people they like interacting with people they like social circles they good at networking and all of this stuff a lot, some people don't don't have a problem with the introverts but some people look down on introverts because they don't understand how could a person not like people 
How could a person not be able to talk to people? I don't get it. Why are you? Why do you want to be alone? Why don't you want to be? Why don't you like social outings? It just doesn't make any sense. Some people have had a spirit to where they good. They good at interacting with folks. Um, they don't. They don't have an issue, right? But some spirits is different. Some spirits. They don't like that. They don't like crowds. They don't like speaking like that. They don't like public speaking. They don't like, they're just not with that. Some spirits is just different. Everybody don't have the social outgoing, you know. Everybody don't got that type of spirit. And the Lord didn't intend for everybody to have the same types of spirits per se. But, he didn't intend for no spirit to be evil and not fulfill his will. All right. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23. It says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that she put off the new, excuse me, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So what does this mean? This means that each and every last one of us, when we come into this truth, is all of us require a renewal of the spirit, right? So you might have had an extrovert spirit. You might have had a spirit that, um, you know, you was outgoing and different things like that. And it, you may be able to carry a lot of those attributes with you into the truth to help help you push this truth. However, um, you had things that you had to, you had to renew, you had to cut out, you had to leave off, you had to put off that old man, right? Uh, same thing with us people that identified as introverts. Uh, we're going to go over some of the some of the traits, some of the things that come with that personification is not bad. It's not a bad thing. However, uh, a lot of those things, a lot of those, um, you know, characteristics that come with that title are things that you have to renew. It's things that you have to you have to create a new man in holiness because. Some of those things are unholy. It doesn't fall within the realm of holiness into the, the realm of the will of God. So you have to renew that, right? You have to, uh, like it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, you have to add unto your faith different things, right? That you, that you may not have had when you was in the world. It's going to require you to change. The truth requires each and every last one of us, each and every last one of us to change, right? And for a lot of us, and, you know, it's scientific studies behind it or whatnot, um, the introvert spirit, a lot of us wasn't born like that. A lot of us in elementary school, uh, we didn't have them type of problems. We could go on stage and perform during a talent show. We could spell big words in front of everybody at the spelling bee. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have no problem interacting with people on the playground or nothing like that. But throughout the course of life, it was different experiences that caused us to change in different ways to make us fall into the introvert category. All right? Not all of us, but for a lot of us, that's what happened. It was experiences that molded us or caused us to become a certain way that falls into the category of an introvert. And I'm explaining. Let me go to Philippians 3.13. So a part of, a big part of renewing the spirit of your mind and creating a new man in holiness is applying this scripture right here. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So a lot of us have past experiences that damaged us, right? A lot of us have uh, 
trauma from different different things that we went through within our life. And once we come into the truth, in order to become that new man in holiness, it's bigger than just changing your ways, per se. It's a lot of it is letting go of the, basically the root cause of you having certain ways. It was something, it was an event, something that was traumatic on your spirit that you have to let go once you come into this truth. Um, you know what I'm saying? And I say me personally, a lot of a lot of situations that I went through dealing with people was just the experience, uh, you could say, uh, I guess you could call it a phrase. It's like every time you let your guard down, you get caught off guard. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? Basically, in situations where you'll make yourself vulnerable to people, uh, whether it's the way that you approach them or uh, the type of, you know, relationship you will develop with somebody, you'll let your guard down and then you get caught off guard, meaning they do something to make you regret opening up to them or just approaching them the way that you, the way that you approach them. You're like, damn, like, if I would have known he or she was going to do this, I wouldn't have talked to them. I wouldn't have opened up to them. I wouldn't have shared this with them. I wouldn't have, blah, blah, blah. And so in the world, that make you be like, oh, man, hell no, nah, I ain't. You know what? I ain't. I ain't. Doing, I ain't doing this no more. I ain't. Come, I ain't being close with a, with this type of people no more. Da, 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 da. And make you rearrange how you approach uh, relationships and relationship development and friendships and you know what I'm saying. Things like that. And for some people, it caused them to walk around within a shell because you made a. You might have been a person that didn't have problems with just greeting people. And one day you might have said hey to somebody. You went up to them like, hey, how you doing? And they just went the hell off on you like, man, you don't know the whatever. And it just damaged you like, damn. So you can't just go up to people and just randomly see how they doing. And, you know, that'll really, that's something small. But that'll really have you like, I ain't doing that no more. I'm not finna just walk around and just talk to people I don't know. So once you get older and you trying to get in a career and they they be like, yeah, you gotta network with people. You gotta go to these type of events and you gotta you gotta meet new people and da da da. That one little traumatic thing that happened when you was 13 when you went up to a stranger and they went the hell off on you and they ignored you or they gave you a cold shoulder or something. It's a, uh, it's like a bad seed in your mind. So you just got an eerie feeling about social events and networking and having a new meet new people. And once you do, you full of anxiety. And you, you just don't want to do that. That's just not your thing, right? Uh, like I said, it's not more so about changing your ways in that uh, aspect because you do have to change those ways but it's more so letting go of whatever is the root cause of you having those ways because a lot of it was just developed from traumatic experiences in life the lord said we got to let go of them things that's behind us right uh, i'm gonna read that verse again it says brethren i count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing i do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So what that verse is telling you, we have to let go of the past experiences in life that held us back, that hindered us. And we got to press toward the mark of our high calling in Jesus Christ, meaning we got to level up. We got to level up. And the only way to level up in this truth, the only way to level up in life is to let go of the things that have been holding you back all your life. All right? So from there, let's go to Job 11 and verse 15. <clears throat> Job chapter 11, verse 
15. It says, For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. Yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear, because thou shalt forget thy misery and remember it as waters that pass away. So the Lord said, in order for you to lift up your face without spot, in order for you to be steadfast and not fear to not have those anxiety issues and to not have those things that have you uh, fearful in approaching certain situations, you have to forget your misery, right? You got to let it go. You got to let go of the memories that caused trauma, that really took a toll on you, that had a negative effect on your spirit. You got to let it go. If you want to level up, and you want to become that new person created in righteousness and holiness, you got to forget your misery. For real. Like, Bishop talk about all the time, like, people that be coming up to him, like, yeah, when I was 14, I was touched. Okay, you 44 now. I understand, you know, whatever. Come, man, come on. You, that was 30 years ago. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. Why are you still dwelling on that? Why is there still a factor in the way that you conduct yourself? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. And that's why you got the issues that you got because you won't let that go. God said we got to forget our misery. And I know it's not It's not like it's just a, okay, I don't remember that no more or whatever. However, you got to do the work. You got to do the work to purge those things out of you. And to leave them behind you. Because that's God didn't even make you the way that you are. Your bad experiences are ingredients to this person that you become. Right? So you gotta hey, you gotta re rock. <laughs> you gotta you gotta purge that out. You gotta become a new man created in holiness, and that's gonna require you to let those things go to purge those those traumatic events. And the, the effect that they had on you out of you. You got to do that. You got to do that. All right. So I want to go into this article. I'm going to go into a couple of articles. Uh, but I'm going to go into this article about, like I told y'all, it's a lot of things that come with being an introvert that's not bad things. It's things that actually, in its truth, will be counted as is wisdom things that um apply in wisdom all right so i'm gonna start with this article it's called it's very well mind.com what is an introvert all right what is an introvert it says what is an introvert of uh, psychiatrist carl jung blah blah According to him, one of the easiest ways to spot an introvert is by the way they recharge, excuse me, their social battery. Introverts, he said, prefer to be in minimally stimulating environments and tend to go inward to recharge, while extroverts are re-energized from interacting with others. Introverts also tend to have a low social desire and often withdraw from social act. Activity. All right. So it's four types of introverts. Hold on. No, this ain't the one I wanted first. What the hell is this? My bad. I got to read the wrong one. I didn't even want this one yet. Come on, man. 
Noise would have missed this the one. I guess I ain't sent it to myself when I was reading it last night. Alright, so verywellmind.com. What is an introvert? Introversion is a personality trait characterized by a focus on internal feelings rather than on external sources sources of stimulation. Introverts and extroverts are often viewed in terms of two extreme opposites, but the truth is that most people most people lie somewhere in the middle. Uh, what is an introvert? The word introvert is used to describe someone who tends to turn inward. Okay, yeah, this this the one. All right, this the article I was looking for. All right, the word introvert is used to describe someone who tends to turn inward, meaning they focus more on internal thoughts feelings and moods rather than seeking out external stimulation all right so that's what an introvert is that's what the word introvert is used to describe it says introverts tend to be more quiet reserved and introspective extroverts gain energy from social interaction while introverts expend energy in social situations after attending a party or spending time with a large group of people, introverts often feel a need to recharge by spending time alone. All right. Scroll down. So, let me see what I... What is the chart? So yeah, so just a few signs. I'm gonna go over a few signs uh, that you are an introvert. So if you're watching this class and you really never heard the term or you heard it but you never really looked into it or you don't know if this is you or not, these are some signs that you are an introvert, all right? And I'm gonna just go over, like I said, I'm gonna go over the, the good things. It's, it's not necessarily it's not something to not wish you were, if that makes sense. All right. Uh, let me see. All right. The first, the first sign that you are an introvert is that you are very self-aware. All right. The first sign that you are an introvert is that you are very self-aware. It says, because introverts tend to be inward turning, they also spend a great deal of time examining their own internal experiences. If you feel like you would have good knowledge and insight into yourself, your motivations, and your feelings, you might be more of an introvert. Introverts tend to enjoy thinking and examining things in their own minds. Self-awareness and self-understanding is important to introverts, so they often devote a great deal of time to learning more about themselves. If you feel that you are self-aware and enjoy gaining deep knowledge about yourself, then you might be more of an introvert, all right? So, we all know that that's, that's not a bad thing at all. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. So introverts tend, tend to be more self-aware than the average person. All right. Second Corinthians 13 and verse five. It says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So the Lord wants you to know yourself. The Lord wants you to examine yourself. The Lord wants you to know who you are. The Lord wants you to be self-aware. Alright? So that's not a bad <laughs> that's not a bad thing. 
All right, let's go to Psalms chapter 4 and verse 4. Psalms chapter 4 and verse 4. All right, it says, Stand in awe and see it not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Say la. So the Bible says, Commune with yourself upon your bed. Meaning what? When you laying down at night, that's a good time to meditate and reflect on yourself. Self reflection, right? Some people may have issues dealing with that. Introverts, they can do that. All night, all night long, an introvert can sit and commune with their heart on their bed all night long. Won't have no problem applying that scripture. All right, so that's a good thing. That's a good thing about being an introvert. You have no problem applying 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 and Psalms 4 verse 4. You will commune with your, commune with your heart on your bed with no, with no problem. All right, another sign that you are an introvert. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, this one kind of can be in certain situations, but we're going to get into that too. All right, but the next sign that you are an introvert is that, uh, let me see. It says you have a small group of close friends. It's another sign that you are an introvert introvert you have a small group of close friends one common misconception about introverts is that they don't like people while introverts typically do not enjoy a great deal of socializing they do enjoy having a small group of friends to whom they are particularly close instead of having a large social circle of people they know only on a superficial level Introverts prefer to stick to deep, long-lasting relationships marked by a great deal of closeness and intimacy. Researchers have found that people high in this trait tend to have a smaller group of friends. Of the many strengths of introverts, one is that they tend to create profound and significant relationships with those closest to them. They also prefer to interact with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis rather than in a large group setting. If your social circle tends to be small but very close, there's a pretty good chance you want an introvert. I know some of y'all read hearing that like, damn, yeah, that's me. That's me right there. Okay. I right, pray to the most high. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, I've, I've pretty much been like that all my life. But it ain't, it ain't, it wasn't it it all good, though. I ain't gonna lie. But for the most part, you know. But basically, what the what it's getting at is, in a sense that you prefer a small circle. Um, within it, because your circle is so small, you're not expending your energy, and all these different relationships with people that you're not really, uh, getting a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction with or whatever, you know, just you got a phone full of contacts and people that you know or whatever, but you really don't know them. You know what I'm saying? Nah, you got a small circle. You got a few people that you talk to on a regular, consistent basis on a one-on-one -on -one type of level. So therefore, you have deeper and more significant interaction with those people. So you're more, you're more close-knit with them. That's a good thing, all right? And guess what? Christ had a small circle, all right? And I'm going to get into why Christ had a small circle. Let's go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2 and verse 24. And this is why a lot of people move the way that they move in that aspect. Because you not, like, for you to for you to not roll like that or to, to not know why it makes sense to roll like that, it could be because you naive, right? If you just want to be friends with everybody and you will call any damn body your friend, more than likely it's because you just, you naive. You don't understand people. You don't understand the ways that people have that could put you in situations of harm, all right? So watch this, John chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, but Jesus did not, did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, 
and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. <laughs> so, uh, the class on the new moon, Deacon Lava brought out a heavy precept. He brought out Sirach 17, 31. It says, flesh and blood will imagine evil, right? Christ, when he walked the earth, he had a very small circle, right? He had the 12 disciples, and within the 12 disciples, he had three in particular that was like the inner circle of his small circle, right? Because he knew what was in man. He knew Negroes wasn't right. You understand? He knew that people have different motives. People have different, uh, you know, people like it ain't it ain't just all good to, to open yourself up to a whole lot of different people. You know what I'm saying? Because if you do, it's, it's people that will take advantage of you. It's people that will do you dirty or do you wrong or whatever the case may be. So it's wise to have a, a small core group of people that you really open yourself up to and get that same thing from them in return and have that close-knit bond that is more, it does more for you get more value out of that, right? It's wisdom in that. It's wisdom in that, all right? So that's, that's not a bad thing, all right? The next sign that you are an introvert, the next sign that you are an introvert, that's not that bad, is, my bad, I, I gotta go back and forth to get the window, is that, um, you enjoy solitude. The next sign that you're an introvert is that you enjoy solitude. Now this one is really, you know, it's a two-edged, whatever, all right? But, so, <clears throat> as an introvert, excuse me, as an introvert, your idea of a good time is a quiet afternoon to yourself to enjoy your hobbies and interests. Activities like time alone with a good book, a peaceful nature walk, or watching your favorite television program help you feel recharged and energized. This does not mean that introverts want to be alone all the time. Many introverts love spending time with friends and interacting with familiar people in social situations. The key thing to remember is that after a long day of social activity, an introvert will probably want to retreat to a quiet place to think, reflect, and recharge. If having a few hours to be alone sounds like your idea of a good time, you just might be an introvert. Some of y'all hearing that like, yes, that's me. That is me right there. Okay. It's, you know, it's not, it's not a bad thing to enjoy solitude because certain things in the spiritual world, you can only do in solitude. If you're one of the people that you always got to be around people and you always got to, you know, you need people to feel good and it, that's, that's not good, all right? You got to have some type of level of enjoyment uh, in solitude because it's only certain things you can do in solitude that's significant for your spirit. All right, so let's go to Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22. Uh, Christ. It says, In straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. So, and that's not the only instance you will see in the Gospels uh, dealing with Christ. But Christ had a tendency to, to separate himself from a crowd to get some alone time. In particular, to pray, right? To communicate with the Lord. Uh, that's very significant within your spiritual journey. Like, you, you can't be somebody... Some people had this issue in the truth. They only, in the spirit, 
when they around brothers and sisters, right? So well, I, I got a perfect example. I ain't gonna go deep into the brother, but um, you know, you no longer with us no more. But this brother, he loved, he embraced the brotherhood like one would embrace a fraternity. You know what I'm saying? It's like, this was something he wanted to be a part of his whole life. He never just had a whole bunch of men that he was just close to and could go over their house and they go over his house and hang out and do all this and this and that or whatever outside of his blood brothers. You know, like he really loved and enjoyed like just the brotherhood. You know what I'm saying? The brother enjoyed the brotherhood. And when he was around the brothers, he was a good brother. He was enjoyable. He was funny. Uh, he was interested in the scriptures around the brothers. You know what I'm saying? And all of that. But when he could not be around the brothers, when he had to deal with himself as an individual, he was never motivated to study on his own. He was battling with all type of lusts and sins and demons. He couldn't hold himself together. He could not hold his own. He couldn't stand on his own ten toes. When he was around the brothers, he was good. But when he had to stand on his own ten toes and be a man, he couldn't. He, he couldn't. He couldn't. Because he didn't. He didn't have. Uh, with you know what Christians like to say, a personal relationship with God. Basically, outside of the brothers, he didn't have. These type, he wasn't doing these type of things that our forefathers was doing. Getting away to get close to God. You understand? Uh, to In order to really pray and really commit. Like if, if the only time you pray is on the Sabbath when we send our prayers with the body. You don't have a prayer life. You don't. You don't keep the commandments in that aspect. Like <laughs> you not. You not. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. Um, the Lord wants you to speak to him directly, one-on-one. -on -one. The Lord wants you to acknowledge your offenses, your transgressions, and pray for what, you know, pray for wisdom, pray for, you know, your daily bread, all of that specifically in terms of yourself. If you only pray when you're in a group, if you only pray when you're at the school, that means you're not praying. You're not. You're not praying. Uh, a real true prayer life requires you to establish some type of routine solitude. All right? That's what Christ did. Uh, let's go to Genesis 24. About our forefather Isaac. Genesis 24 and verse 63. Genesis 24 and verse 63. It says, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. So what was Isaac doing? Isaac had a routine where he would go out in the sunset by himself and meditate. That's like, so I'm, I'm just keep it real with y'all. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, as far as the technicalities and all of that and, the, you know, the character traits or whatever, I would be considered a, a, an introvert, right? So these type of things, if that's you, you understand how, um, important it is for you to do these things to have peace and to really feel, you know what I'm saying? Um, this is this is how you able to remember scriptures. This is how you able to to really dwell on the classes that get brought out, or to really um, to read effectively. Like when I like, I ain't gonna lie. Like, so you may hear in certain classes or whatever, you might hear somebody say that you should study with your wife. You know what I'm saying? And I'm speaking to the men. If you're able to study with your wife, I commend you. That's, that's good. That's how I pray to the Most High. One thing I can do, two things I can do. I can read with my wife. Like, we can read through the four chapters 
uh, well, we actually do this routinely. We read the four chapters, and then when we're done reading, she asks me questions on the chapter that we read. And we go over, you know, we handle her questions. Or I can go over something with my wife. I can teach my wife what I already know. But to sit down and study with my wife, that's not happening. That's not possible in my world. Like, for me to study, like, I, the TV got to be off. The kids got to be away from me. Everybody got to get away from me, for me to study. Now, I can sit up, I might be able to go over a little something, or kind of tune out it. I can get in my bubble and tune out what's around me or whatever. But to really meditate and good, good quality studying, I got to be by my damn self. I got to be in a very peaceful, solitary, solitary environment. And that's when I get the most quality meditation and studying. For real. You need solitude to really... If you that type of brother that should be like, yeah, I don't like, I don't understand why I can't remember scriptures that good or I'm, I can't retain, I can't retain classes that good or whatever. Is you doing this like what Isaac did? Is you making time throughout your day to get some solitary, good quality meditation? Is you going somewhere by yourself in a setting, a peaceful setting to where you can really dwell on and really meditate and study the scriptures. You know what I'm saying? That That's something that our forefathers did. And that's, that really uh, is really important to spiritual peace. All right? So that's not a bad thing for you to enjoy solitude because our forefathers needed solitude for prayer and meditation. If you're a spiritual person, prayer and meditation is like top five important things in your life. Top, probably top three. For real. So that's not a bad thing. You introvert. If that you already just like to do that, to just to get in your own little world and just think about stuff, use that to your advantage and convert that to your study time, to your prayer time. When you get away by yourself, that's your time to draw near to the Lord and meditate, seek out the book of the Lord and read. That's a good thing, all right? So, the next sign that you're an introvert. The next sign is not a bad thing. It is... Uh, It says, people think that you're quiet. People think that you're quiet, all right? And or people may find it difficult to get to know you. It says, introverts, well, mm, uh, yeah, I'm going to read this. Basically, when I read on a website on the mobile version, because I was on my phone reading these articles. They had all of these in the chart. So I put them in order based on the chart. But on the article, the chart is not on the page. So they got it in a different order. And they got the categories labeled a little different than what I put in my notes. So uh, basically, the category or the sign is actually people think that you're quiet. So it says, introverts are often described as quiet, reserved, and mellow, and are sometimes mistaken for being shy. While some introverts certainly are shy, people should not mistake an introvert's reserve for timidity. In many cases, people with this personality type simply prefer to choose their words carefully and not waste time or energy on needless, needless chit-chat. If you are the quiet type and a bit reserved, you are probably an introvert, all right? So, people think you're quiet. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 27. 
Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 27. It says, he that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So those two, those two scriptures right there, Proverbs 17, 27, and 28, uh, quietness is a... Uh, Golden trait. <laughs> quiet being the ability to be quiet is biblically praised. You understand? It said the man that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So if you just naturally quiet and reserved, that's a great thing. That's a great thing right there. Alright? Just depending on the situation. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into that. It's a right chapter because it's a it's a such thing in the Bible called bashfulness, uh, which goes into the the worldly term we know as shy. Uh, basically, bashfulness can result in sin if um, because it's it's times where stuff happening you have to speak up. If you don't speak up due to your, you know your overly being reserved or whatever it can it can it can result in sin now a lot of people not an introvert on that level is for basically they quiet because they not into small talk they not they don't talk just to talk they talk when it's necessary all right in that case that's what we going into it's absolutely nothing wrong with that all right it's absolutely nothing wrong with that there's, it's actually a lot of wisdom in there. So it's right chapter 21 and verse 26. So right 21 and verse 26. It says, The heart of fools is in their mouth, but the mouth of the wise is in their heart. Meaning what? The mouth of a fool, he going to say everything that's on his mind. Proverbs 29 and 11 say, A fool uttereth all his mind. Right, you're going to say, you basically, you're going to be a babbler. Nobody really likes those people, all right? Now, it's, in certain situations, maybe certain professions or uh, certain engagements or whatever, that type of person is highly necessary. And it, and it may seem that they tend to be more successful, people that, that talk a lot. But... Uh, Usually, people that, that's not really into that, when they do talk, it's more effective. You know what I'm saying? It's more effective. It's more significance in the things that they say because they choose their words wisely. They're not just saying the first thing that comes to their mind. They, they commune with their own heart. They break down the conversation and the thing, they evaluate the situation like, okay, if I say this, then this is going to happen and it's going to trigger this and that person. All of that, it's, it's like a 10-minute worth of conversation going on in your head before you say one sentence. All right? It's wisdom in that. All right? It's wisdom in that. It's nothing wrong with that. All right? So, uh, let's look at the four types of introverts. So, those are the signs that you're an introvert. That's not necessarily bad things, all right? It's not bad things. They're actually biblically approved uh, within a, you know, spiritual context. So now we're going to look at the four types of introverts, all right? Because it's not just a big blanket. Like, it's not just, it's different, it's different types, all right, per science, all right, so a social introvert, it says, this type of introvert prefers small versus large groups of people. They prefer a quiet night at home over a night out. All right? Uh, so, now it's like, it's a great area within that. Because some people, they like to go places and they like to, like they like to be around people like they like to go to places where people is at but they just not 
interactors. They not finna go to a party and dance with everybody or dance in front of everybody, but they still go to the party. You know what I'm saying? Social introverts is the people that really, they don't like going nowhere. Like, they don't like going out. They don't like those type of settings. They just not into that. They not into being around a whole lot of people at a big social gathering. Some people are that type of introvert. Like, that's their thing. They just don't like, they don't like big social gatherings. They just don't like being there, period. All right? Next type of introvert. You got thinking introverts. Thinking introverts. Introverts in this category tend to spend a lot of time thinking. They are introspective and creative. These type of introverts, it's good. These the introverts that we grew up with in school, that we wonder why they were so quiet and they spend most of their time in a library, uh, in class. You know, we had a substitute. They wasn't talking with everybody and joking and clowning. They was in the corner reading a book. Them the type of people that turned into Steve Jobs. Them the type of people that turned into damn NASA rocket scientists and all of that. You know what I'm saying? They invested their time. They did basically they fed their imagination. They 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 lived more within their imagination and their intellect than in the world interacting with people. And for a lot of people, that pays off for them, right? Um, that pays off for them, for them people, the people that, you know, and it, it's usually kind of the narrative, the people, the little geeks and nerds that get made up, made fun of in school because they're not really socially equipped. They, meantime, they get smart as hell, all right? Because they, they, they spend a lot of time thinking and they spend a lot of time feeding and nourishing their brain and uh that ends up paying out paying off for them at some point. Alright? Uh the third type of introvert is an anxious introvert. Anxious introverts. It says anxious introverts often feel unsettled or nervous around people during social interactions. <coughs> like I said, this type of introvert you the difference between this and a social social introvert, like I said, you may not have a problem going places. You may be an outgoing person. You know, I'm saying this because I identify with this. I ain't gonna lie. So you don't mind going. You actually like going places. You don't like just sitting in the house all the damn time. However when you go to these places and whatnot, when it comes to like engagement and social interaction, you get anxious, you have anxiety. This, you don't really, you don't want to have to do all of that. You just want to go somewhere, it's a vibe, you, you sharing that experience, you're not missing out on the experience, but you're not into the, the social engagement, the social interaction piece of it. This, it makes you anxious. All right, that's very common. That's not that's not a good thing though. That's not really that's not really good. It's not really healthy. Uh, but you know, like I said, that one I would say is one of the things that you you not you generally not born with that. It's something that it's stuff that happened in your life that kind of make you that way. All right. Uh, the fourth type of introvert is inhibited introverts, all right? And this one is, I guess you could say, the better type of introvert. So, inhibited introverts, this type of introvert tends to overthink spending a significant amount of time considering a decision before doing anything. So, it uses the term overthink, so it makes you think like this is bad. But basically, this introvert is, uh, excuse me, they are very uh, precautious. Uh, the word you, I mean, I said the word, well, it is the word. The Bible used terms like circumspect, prudent, uh, people that 
really think and consider before they do stuff or say stuff because they understand they they evaluate all of the possible negative effects that can come behind it if it's not done the right way or said the right way. That's a good thing. Like we went into like the signs about you know thinking before you speak and stuff like that. Like I said, that's scriptural. Uh, but it you can be overly. It can hurt you if you you are that to the furthest extent. You know what I'm saying? Because you you will overthink. You will think that it's not the right time to do this or say this. But it really turns into bashfulness. It really turns into missed opportunities and things of that nature. But those are the four types of introverts. Social thinking introverts, anxious introverts, and inhibited introverts. All right? So you might be one of those. You might be a combination of those. But those are what science breaks down as the four types of introverts. All right? So I'm going to read a couple of quotes. Before I get into the, you know, really dig into the bad things about being an introvert, I'm going to read the quotes, <clears throat> some quotes that will make you, you know, not feel that bad or beat yourself up about falling into that category per se. All right. So it says, yes, I am. I'm an introvert. I'm not shy. I'm a noticer. I am a thinker. I'm an observer. I'm not stuck up. I'm not antisocial. I treasure my solitude. I'm not a fan of small talk. I prefer a few close friends. I am reserved until I'm not. I appreciate true connection. If we connect, you matter to me. So that quote is like, because you know it's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings. Like the, the uh, introvert's biggest testimony is that they're misunderstood. All right? So that quote is like to clear up some of the, the thoughts from outsiders, how they may think of a person that's an introvert. It's like, no, nah, I'm not this, I'm that. I'm not this, I'm that. I'm actually this. No, no, no. All right, so, okay. Oh, All right, so here you go, another quote. Two types of introverts. <clears throat> Two types of introverts. Type one, they like to be alone. They like being quiet in quiet environment. They prefer staying in, excuse me. They prefer staying in because there is too much stimulation outside. They get tired very quickly when they are exposed to the outdoor too long. They can be in their room as long as possible without getting bored. There's always something going on in their mind or on their desk. Type two, introvert type two, they like to be alone. They are not necessarily quiet. They get easily bored. They like to go out and explore on their own. They like traveling and trying out new things, but often wear headphones so that they can keep the experience to themselves without interacting with other people. They don't mind stimulation from the world as long as they have enough privacy to digest it by themselves. So those are per se the two types of introverts. Some people, uh, I hate to say this, but you know, you just weird, you know, like coming outside, like being in the house, you know, I, that's the weirder one in my opinion, but that might be you, you know, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? No shade, no shade. Type two, you you go outside. You like enjoying the world. You like experiencing things and stuff like that. But you know you like you like to embrace it more so per, on a personal level by yourself. You're not into having it because it kind of you know in a wrong train of thought you feel like experiencing something with a whole bunch of people is kind of a burden because you kind of have some type of responsibility as to whether they enjoy it the way that you enjoy it. Like, for example, you go to an amusement park with 12 people and you, if you went by yourself, you would go directly to the rides that you would want to go to, you know what I'm saying, 
you know, you would uh, buy at the concession stand what you wanted to buy. You go to the bathroom, you want to go to the bathroom. Like, you know that you can fully engulf the the activities of the amusement park effectively by yourself. But if you go with 12 people, you're going to go on rides you don't want to go on. People going to be complaining about the ride that you choose, that you got everybody waiting in line with you and try to make it seem like it's a stupid ride to go on. You going to have to go to the bathroom with people and wait on certain people. Or, you know, it, it's like it drain, it kind of ruined the experience. Like, damn, like, you know, like I could have had more fun by my damn self. You see what I'm saying? So... A lot of us fit that category. Like, you would go to an amusement park. You just don't want to go with a large group of people and feel like it's going to take away from your experience. All right? So that, that's what a lot of us experience. As if you were so-called introvert. So now, let me see. Let me see. Let me go to the next article real quick. I think this is the one I started reading earlier. No, it's not. Okay, insider.com. How did it how did it scroll down to something I didn't have it on? Alright. So now I'm going to deal with the potential disadvantages of being an introvert. Cause I acknowledge like the good things, like if you fit this or whatever, that's not a bad thing. Uh I acknowledge myself. You know what I'm saying? I, I identify as one and this and this and that, blah, blah, blah. But now I'm finna get on this. All right? I'm finna get on this. <laughs> So-called introverts, the bad thing. All right, so it's two main potential disadvantages in being, a, uh, in being an introvert. But it breaks down its different depths within those two like the two commandments the two great commandments love your name you love yourself and love the lord they break down into over 600 different damn things so same thing with this all right so the first potential disadvantage it says potential awkwardness in social settings that's number one potential awkwardness in social settings introverts may feel awkward in larger groups of people Introverts are often misunderstood as well. People may assume they're unfriendly or aloof due to their more internal observant nature. All right, so the awkwardness in social settings, what's bad about that? Let's start with Sirach chapter 25 and verse 1. Sirach 25 verse 1. It says, In three things I was beautified, and it stood up beautiful before God and man. The unity of brethren, the love of neighbors, a man and a wife that agree together. Excuse me. So the love of neighbors and the unity of brethren, God values that, right? If you, if social awkwardness is such an issue for you, they may result in you not embracing the unity of brethren. Basically, when certain events take place or certain gatherings, uh, you're invited to uh, you probably ain't gonna show up like if it's not you know like you hear some people say like if it ain't a commandment like I ain't like you can't fault me for not doing it like it's not a commandment to come to the uh, the Sunday barbecue at the school like the commandment is to keep the Sabbath so don't be calling me trying to correct me about showing up on Sunday I paid my dues yesterday at the Sabbath. You got some spirits like that. And that's really in violation to the will of God. God's will is for us to be unified. And that goes beyond just one day out of the week. All right? If it's the social awkwardness is such a big issue for you that that has you to where you don't want to come around when you don't have to. Like, it's an open invitation, but you still don't want to come because you just, your social awkwardness or whatever, that's a problem. That's a problem. That can result, that can result in some bad things. 
All right, let's go to Proverbs 18, verse 24. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. It says, A man that have friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So the Bible says, if you want friends, then you have to show yourself friendly. Right? Now, the truth is not, it's not, friendship like it's not about making friends like you did in high school like yeah he dressed how i dress i think we should eat lunch together but you know whatever the, the little dumb shit the little excuse my language like some stuff sisters be thinking like oh she we like the same body type and we wear the same type of hair wraps like we're gonna be friends like no all right what is going into basically in this truth you gonna want relationships to where people have your back. You know what I'm saying? Every within this truth, you gonna want to have people that vouch for you, that that's willing to help you, to stick their neck out for you. You know, different things like that. You want those righteous bonds and friendships. When you got the social awkwardness problem, that can hinder you from basically you'll miss opportunities on building real great bonds with people that were uh that would save your life it might it could save your life it could elevate your life but you miss out on those opportunities to create those bonds because you overly socially awkward that's that's not good the bible said in order to build these relationships with these people within the body you must show yourself friendly you can't be uh, walking around the school with your head down, uh, sitting way in the back corner, and as soon as we say power is money at the end of the class, you hit it out the door. Like no, that's not that's not how you build rapport within the body. You know what I'm saying? That that's gonna come back and bite you. That's gonna you shooting yourself in the foot when you roll it like that. All right, let's go to Sirach 14 and verse 14. So Rock 14, verse 14. It says, Defraud not thyself of the good day, and let not the part of a good desire overpass thee. So like I said, like we was going into the different types of introverts. Some, some people that introverts don't have this problem because they they like to experience they don't miss out on events they go they just don't socially interact or engage you know what i'm saying which is still a still an issue like you're not showing yourself friendly whatever however some people are the introverts on a level like the other type that we read they really don't like to go out they really just don't like going places where like people at and it's truth, we have holy convocations over 70 per year. And we have just events that get coordinated with that at your school. S some people, they get in the shell or whatever. They get uh, overly worked up in anxiety or whatever to, to the point where they will literally just fall back. Like you, you, you trying to like you know you'll be uh, you'll have somebody that you work with or whatever you're trying to get them to come to the school they'll come you talk to them at work like everything was alright or whatever like yeah 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 I liked it I liked I enjoyed the class I enjoyed the teaching I enjoyed it like I'm gonna come back then the next Sabbath you don't see them you text them while you at the Sabbath they don't respond to, to you and it's you know it's the weird like you don't know if they sick you don't know you don't know what they are going on you see them at work you like damn why you ain't, what happened why you didn't show up why you ain't respond to my man I just, man I just, you know I, just, I don't know I don't you know just them weird responses like I, I don't I mean I, they don't want like they can't they don't really got no straight answer a lot of them deal with that you know what I'm saying? A lot of them deal with that. Like, they just introverted. Like, it's like a burden on them. Like, damn, I got to be around. I, I got to show up to this every week. And I got to make sure that I'm a certain way around people. And I got to 
stand up with them. And some people just don't really like that. And that results in them missing, missing out on joy, being joyful in the Lord. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Turning up for the Lord and having a good time in the Lord, in the spirit of the Lord and righteousness. You know what I'm saying? God said, don't, do that's defrauding yourself. When you let your introvert problems cause you to fall back and miss out on these great experiences and these memories that we make in this truth, you are defrauding yourself. You're defrauding yourself of those good times. You're defrauding yourself of those good desires. Uh, people telling you, like, you don't want to miss this, bro. You want to be here. We're going to do this. We're going to have fun. And da, da, da. But because of your uh introvert problem you miss out that's not good for your spirit that can result in you having an unhealthy spirit in the lord because the scriptures say that the joy of the lord is your strength if you defrauding yourself of the joy of the lord by being an introvert then you're going to that's going to cause you to potentially become weak in the spirit because you're not strengthening your spirit with those good days with those good times in the spirit all right uh, ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 let's get ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 we're still dealing with the socially awkwardness or whatever the disadvantage of being an introvert Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9 it says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor for if they fall the one will lift up his fellow but woe to him that is alone when he falleth for he have not another to help him up hmm. so if you that person that fly solo you rather be by yourself you not uh you're not showing yourself friendly because you're socially awkward. That means that you're not going to be able to develop friendships, relationships within the body. And everybody ain't going to have a point within their life or be going through something where you need somebody. Shalom, Israel. This is Bishop Nathaniel. I want you to know that you can view all our Sabbath classes live on IUIC TV. That's right, I said on IUIC TV. Download the app today. Shalom. I'm telling y'all, Memphis, that Memphis, you know, Memphis jacked up. I ain't saying IUIC Memphis, I'm saying the city of Memphis. You know what I'm saying? Player Fly, he said, it's an infamous quote. Nobody need nobody. That's a lie. Play a fly, lie to y'all. That's not true. To say nobody needs nobody is a damn lie. You understand? Everybody needs somebody. For real. Everybody gonna need somebody at some point. And if you're socially awkward, you're not showing yourself friendly to develop these relationships with certain people and have people gravitate to you or whatever, um, it's gonna backfire. It's gonna backfire, for real. So, just a warning. And I'm gonna touch, I'm gonna touch a little bit more on that in a little bit too, all right? I'm saying that like I just got an hour left. Lord's willing within 30 minutes, I'm gonna circle back around to that point more in depth. All right, but let me get to the second disadvantage. So the second disadvantage or potential disadvantage of being an introvert is you have difficulty managing emotions. <clears throat> and this is what a lot of us may not want to face or come to grips with if you identify as an introvert. Believe it or not, yes, you potentially have difficulty managing your emotions per se more than an average person. So it says a small 2020 study also found that introverts may have more trouble managing their emotions. Researchers suggested, excuse me, this could happen in part because introverts 
have a tendency to turn inward to grapple with negative feelings. As a result, they might ruminate or dwell on unwanted emotions rather than seek help coping with them. Hmm. So basically getting in your own head, becoming your own counselor, that shit is dangerous. If you're an introvert, you probably got that problem. It's very likely that you have that problem. People ask you who your counselor, you say, you say somebody that you talked to one time six months ago. That's a lot of y'all. That's a lot of y'all. Some of y'all, and you know me, I'm a camp leader, so I be having to validate certain things. A brother may say, he may ask a brother, who you be counseling with? He be like, such, 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 such. And he'll say it like in a way to where, like it's like passively convincing, like, yeah, since I get counsel, I counsel with them. I like this. Yeah, it's my counselor. Yeah, whatever. Uh, okay. So, you talk to that person. It ain't like you just go behind them. You may have a that same person that they said they counsel with. You may be having a casual conversation with them or whatever. And you just casually like, hey, um, you know, I know you be talking to such and such, right? Like, how he doing over there? You know, in his personal, you know, everything good with him? Like, and that person that this guy said that he counseled with, you talking to that person and he come up and he like, who? What? Uh, I ain't talked to him since last year. I, I don't know. How he, tell me how he doing. But when you just talk, when you just ask that brother who his counselor was, he said him and his counselor is telling you they only talk once or twice. He don't know what the hell going on to do. Like, that's Cap. I don't know why he naming me as his counselor. He need to cut it out. Some of y'all be doing that. Some of y'all be doing that. And you just may have a problem of it. You think that you can solve your own problems with your own counselor not knowing that when you operate like that, when you don't have an outlet, when you don't have somebody that you speaking to concerning your problems and your issues, the negative emotions, the, the feelings that come behind these issues, unfortunately, within this flesh, those things are going to overpower the positive. You're going to be dwelling on more than negative thoughts by default because you don't got nobody talking sense into you and trying to get you to see it in a better light or no you should look at it this way da, da, da. because that's what happened when you have conversations with people and all that they they have you looking at stuff in a different perspective if you don't have that outlet if you don't have nobody to steer your perspective in the right way then you're going to trust in your own personal perspective which is probably going to be negative that's why some people be thinking people hate them. A brother correct you one time and you just think he got it out for you. You know what I'm saying? A brother uh, frown at something that you do and you don't like, okay, you may like, yeah, it was wrong, but then you didn't have to frown like that. Like he probably just don't like me. You know what I'm saying? Like those, those evil things that pop up in your mind. And you may not necessarily just fully think that all the way at first, but because you're not getting counseled or consulting with wise people uh, that can give you insight on those type of situations, those negative thoughts are, are spring up within you. So when something else happens, that's the first thing in your mind. Like, nah, dude don't like me. I knew he didn't. He ain't never liked me because last year... When I didn't hold the door for that sister, he mugged me like, what was wrong with you? So now, when I just, yeah, no, stop it. All right, so anyway, <laughs> June 19. June 19. So if you're an introvert, this could be you, and this is scary. This is dangerous. All right. June verse 19. 
It says, these be they who separate themselves. Uh-oh. Let me read that again. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. That's scripture right there. Ooh. So, as an introvert, you know, of course, you like time to yourself. But there's, remember we read that God was beautiful to God is the unity of brethren and the love of neighbors, right? So you can be an introvert and still apply that per se. However, because of your introvert tendencies or whatnot, um, something will happen and you'll get in your own head and you would think the solution is to separate yourself from a person or a group of people or just the body as a whole because you just you not vibing with them right now. It's I don't I'ma just I'ma just fall back. I'ma just da 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 when that's never the solution. The scripture says endeavor to keep the unity. You supposed to fight to keep the unity. If something happens to trouble the unity that's a problem that needs to be solved. And separating yourself is not the way to solve it. The reason why you separating yourself is going into sensual. It says separate themselves sensual. That means you have become emotional. You have, because you're not getting counsel, because you don't have an outlet, you don't have anybody to talk sense into you biblically, you, those negative emotions have fueled you to separate yourself. And once you do that, within the activity of doing that, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord would never move you to separate yourself. You understand? So the spirit is leaving you. <laughs> the spirit of the Lord is leaving you because you want to do your own thing. You understand? That's a dangerous it's a dangerous thing, and that tends to happen, take place with people that more so identify as introverts. Because if you are a naturally social person throughout your life, then you understand what comes with that, more so than an introvert. If you're a naturally social person, you understand that people going to rub you the wrong way. You're going to rub people the wrong way. That's a part of being social. Therefore, because you're social, you have the experience that you have gone through the process of working those things out for the purpose of continuing positive social interaction. You know how to iron stuff out. You don't got no problem with confrontation. You don't got a problem with facing an issue with a person head on, uh, just talking something out. You don't deal with that. But an introvert, especially if they don't have a counselor, and they, they feel like they too wise for counsel or whatever. And they will have that issue and it will end up causing them to lead the damn truth. And they will convince themselves for as long as the Lord allowed to believe that they still in the truth. It was you. You the problem. You the re Y'all the... You, y'all, the... Ah. But no. No. Alright, Proverbs chapter 18 verse 1. So what happens when you uh, when you separate yourself? Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. It says, Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. So we just read in Jude 9, when you separate yourself out of your emotions, you having not the spirit. The spirit of the Lord is not... And they didn't move you to do that. You're not moving in the spirit, obviously. So when you separate yourself and you go to seek wisdom, the spirit of the Lord is not with you. So in your seeking of wisdom, you will start to dibble and dabble with things that's not wisdom. <laughs> you understand? You will get into all weird doctrine. That's how that's how people will find themselves sitting down and watching a two-hour video of you liar breaking down 
the damn whatever or the YLF IUIC. You got to think, what a, what a cause any of us on this class right now to, to go and watch that shit? Probably because you just got corrected by somebody in IUIC. You just got judged by somebody in IUIC. You just got, uh, you know what I'm saying, uh, addressed in a way that you didn't like by somebody in IUIC. So what? You were, hmm, hmm, I don't know if that, I don't know if they was really right for that. So, like, I, I kind of feel like maybe I don't know if I should return. Let me see if, you know, if I'm not the only one. So you will you will sit up there, you will intermeddle, you will start to meddle with many matters and all of that, and you will find yourself in that same boat, never coming back. Or you'll just start to looking in different doctrines. I wonder how this cat, this cat be seeing this camp out on the street. They put in work too. Like we we literally had a brother do that, child. So let me tell y'all what happened. True story. He might be watching this class because he still be watching uh, IUIC. And it's no shade to you, bro. I love you. You know I love you. But you know. That I'm going to keep it real with you. To your face, on the class. Hell. But anyway, so this brother. <laughs> this brother had a, a issue with his tongue. You know what I'm saying? He would say the darndest things. He was like the scripture that we read. The heart of fools is in their mouth. That was him. Now, of course, when you're knowing the truth, we see your spirit and all that. We know that. That's just your thing that you got to purge out. So it's mercy in that. It's, okay, we got to deal with him like this. We're going to try this. We're going to put him under this person. We're going to work with him. You know, we tried to work with the brother. We show mercy to the brother, all that. But brother just end up going too damn far. One day, I forgot what the hell. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. I'm going to keep it all the way real. What happened? <laughs> so... I got demoted. I had got uh, put out in the motor. This was late 2020. So I came back into the body. Uh, I was a brother for a couple months or whatever. And then I ended up getting reinstated. So the night I got reinstated, this brother decided to express. Now he called me and shared his uh, excitement Hey man, I'll oh, pray to the most high, you back. Pray for me that I that I stay in the spirit and you know the Lord, you know, it, it don't happen again, you know what I'm saying? Uh yeah, bro, appreciate it, whatever, but you know, just uh thank you for your excitement, but just pray for me that I stay in the spirit this time around. I don't do the dummy again, right? So, okay. So we had a phone conversation. I already got the congratulations and the salutations and the excitement from the brother. He should be good. He got his rocks off. He let me know how proud he is and how happy he is I'm reinstated. This brother decides to get on Telegram and type a long message. All oh, praises we are off so many well back. Cause golly, I don't know how long I was gonna be able to take the mother officers. Da, da, da. They tried to hold it down, but it just wasn't quite the same without all the Like, brother was at first of all, he was wrong because the brothers was holding it down. You know what I'm saying? I could have stayed demoted for three, four, five years, and now you see Arkansas still would have been doing a damn thing. Let's get that out there. But the brother decided to type that and express that and like, come on, bro, what the hell is wrong with you? Cut it out. So we called a brother. We called a brother like, hey, man, listen. We understand your excitement. We understand this and this and that. But your ass out of order. You tweaking. You know what I'm saying? It's really disrespectful. Like, them brothers was holding it down. Them brothers was still doing their thing. You know what I'm saying? Whatever. So this brother get offended. This brother get offended that we tell him to take the post down. And he was tripping and he was out of line. 
And the brother goes so far as to say, within this conversation, he goes so far as to say, man, F R U I C. So <laughs> at this point, brother, y'all had you nah bro. Nah, you out of there. You out of there. And because we corrected him for going too far in expressing his appreciation for me being reinstated by simultaneously disrespecting the brothers that was holding it down while I was down, it, him being corrected in that caused him to be offended and say F-I-U-I-C. So we had to put the brother out. Like, bro, bro, no, yo, ass, you got to go. You got to reevaluate yourself. You can't, nah, you not finna just say F-I-U-I-C and still be out your line, bro. You got to hey. Nah, bro. Mm-mm. So we put the brother out. We ain't intend on putting him out alone. Just a little time out. Like a little, you know. Yeah, bro, you need a time out. You know what I'm saying? But apparently the brother couldn't last a week being put out. I don't think it was a week. It might have been, it might have been like two, three weeks. So within two or three weeks, we find somebody run across a video of another camp. I ain't gonna say the camp. Somebody run across a video of another camp. This brother is reading. And it, mind you, it, cause you know, with other camps, we don't have an issue as far as like, as long as you teach the commandments or whatever, do the thing. But this particular camp, they are primarily comprised of people that was once IUIC, no BS. They like the people, basically the people that left. That group is, that's the niche. You left IUIC, but you still want to be in the truth? Come here. Not only that, these brothers, they will t go and teach at our camp spots when we not there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, out of all the places in the city, all the places in Little Rock, North Little Rock, they want to go to where they see us set up in. So the camp spot that the brother was reading at was one of our spots that they go and sneak and teach at when we not teaching there. So we're like, damn, bro, come on, really? You got put out for two weeks for saying something that you know was highly disrespectful. You deserve the time out. But you couldn't handle that? You going and read for another camp? Man, did that just show you how low level that camp is? This brother was just with us. This brother... Been around y'all for a couple weeks and I already reading for y'all on the street. Y'all, that's kind of pathetic. I ain't trying to throw no shade, but damn, bro. Y'all need to get it together. But that's what the brother ended up doing. You know, I said all that to say, <laughs> like I said in Proverbs 18 and 1, when you separate yourself, you'll go and seek and intermeddle with other things outside of the doctrine that you've been taught. You'll go and seek and look at other camps You'll look at other doctrines. You'll look into the Why I Live videos. You'll end up being bugged the hell out. Because you just caught up in your own mind. Alright? From there, Proverbs 12, verse 15. See, I spent too long on this story. I didn't mess my little time up. But that's a real, that, that happened in real life. That happened in real life. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. It says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, meaning what? He think he can figure out all his problems, all his issues. But we just read that research shows that when you that type of person, you will tend to dwell on negative thoughts. So you right in your own eyes, not knowing that your own thoughts are corrupting your mind. And you're not getting the counsel to reveal that to you. So that that's why that's the difference between the wise and the foolish in that aspect. If you wise, you're gonna hark in the counsel. You're gonna get that outside source of wisdom to either validate or correct your thoughts. You understand? If not, you're gonna end up 
in the way of a fool. You're going to end up uh, <laughs> embodying what comes with being a fool because you're right in your own eyes. You understand? And that will lead to your demise. Let's go to Sirach 6 and verse 2. <clears throat> Sirach chapter 6 and verse 2. And that story, I think about that story too. That, that story that brother so sad because his wife was just, his his wife was diligent in the body. She loved coming around. She loved the body. She loved the sisters. She, you know, all of that. And when we had to break it to her, like, I mean, that's your Lord, you know. He's still in the troop. I mean, he with the other camp, you know, this week, you know, you know. How the body can't stand you. You can't be coming in the purple and gold while he over there with the the mother colors. And you gotta, you know, roll with your Lord. His sister was all in. His sister was crying. It was so sad. It was man. I still feel for that sister. For real, this is terrible. It's terrible. That's it's another story. That's a lot similar, but I'm gonna leave that alone. All right, Sirach chapter 6 and verse 2. It says, Extol not thyself in the counsel of thine own heart, that thy soul be not torn in pieces as a bull strain alone. Y'all see that? It says, Extol not thyself in the counsel of your own heart, because you will end up being destroyed. You'll end up being devoured. Like somebody, basically like an animal, you know, like in a jungle, Animals prey on each other, right? Uh, like a lion, per se. Like the scriptures say, the devil goes about as a roaring lion. A lion ain't gonna run up on a pack of bulls to eat. He's going to prey on the one that decides to go astray from the rest of the pack. If you're an introvert and something happens and you feel like you justified in the sense of separating yourself, you are entering into the devil's playground. You're entering into that, um, that danger of being devoured by that lion. You understand? And that's typically what would happen. You would start yourself in a counsel in your own heart. You're going to go off because you're having not the spirit. You don't have the protection and guidance from the Lord no more. You, the spirit has left you. You're not dealing with the spirit of the Lord. Therefore, you will be devoured by Satan. You will be destroyed by Satan. You dead meat. That's what the Bible says. You want to install yourself in the counsel of your heart? You dead meat. That's one of the dangers that come with that introvert spirit. You're more susceptible to falling into that category. All right? Or into that uh, occurrence. So, I'm going to uh, diverge into the last leg of the class. Because uh, I'm really, I really be trying to be done by 9 o'clock Central Time. But, I want to go into basically how to overcome being an introvert. Alright? In terms of the negative aspects. So, you know, we went over... What we went over so far is the things, the attributes of an introvert that's not bad. Like they biblically, uh, they're biblically approved. It's not bad to do this, why this and this and that. You know what introverts typically do because of them being an introvert. However, you do have the disadvantages, the things that being an introvert can lead to that can hurt you, that can harm you, that can hinder you, right? So... Uh, if you fall into the category of an introvert, there's certain things that you will have to overcome to reach your maximum potential in this truth, especially if you're a leader. All right, so let me, uh, let's go to Sirach 33, 17 real quick. Sirach 33, verse 17. It says, consider that I labor not for myself only, but for all them that seek learning. Um... The biggest challenge to being an introvert, because remember, an introvert is somebody that really enjoys spending time with themselves, uh, 
being in their own thoughts, dwelling on, you know, self-reflection, self-awareness, I don't know. Basically, what they can do is, if you don't catch yourself and properly, uh, you know, channel that in the right ways, you will become full of yourself. You understand? And you will only, you will do things that's for your best interest over others. And that's the complete opposite of how we're supposed to move in this truth. That will result in a lack of charity. You won't be considerate. You won't, you, you, you're going to be out of the spirit, for real. So you have, basically, you have to, uh, the first thing is, is realizing and accepting the fact that this truth is bigger than you. It's not about you. This truth is not about you. I know you feel like this and certain you got these certain tendencies and all of that, but it's certain tendencies that's not good, it's not healthy for the purpose of this gospel, of this mission, of the rebuilding of our nation. So you have to sacrifice those tendencies. You have to kill them. You have to dead them uh, for the furtherance of the gospel and the betterment of your nation over the satisfaction of yourself, all right? Because you're not laboring for yourself only, but for the nation as a whole, all right? So let me get into this article. This is, now this is in the context of business, uh, being, becoming a business leader or somebody that's of rank uh, within a business, but you're an introvert, all right? So with that being said, it's like, okay, we understand that you have the intellect, you have the potential to be a good like we're gonna put you in this in this position. However, certain stuff you're gonna have to you're gonna have to overcome. You're gonna have to become more of this and less of this to become successful as a leader in a business. But we gonna convert it to being in this truth. Alright? So it says the 12 challenges introverted leaders face and how to overcome them. This is Forbes.com. I ain't going to go into all 12. I just picked a little few to go into. All right. So the first way to overcome being an introvert is to get out of your head. All right. Get out of your head. It says introverts tend to process internally. And as a result, don't always communicate their thinking to the team. Introverts can be hard to read, which leaves extroverts and employees often uncertain and uncomfortable. Provide your team with information in multiple ways. Make them feel in the loop and watch productivity soar. That's heavy. I'm cut. All right. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 16. It says... Uh, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So the Lord approves. The Lord is pleased when we communicate. One of the biggest issues that introverts have is communication. Why? Because you may be so confident within yourself that you know it's something that's going to work or we're going to do this to do that. And you forget to run that down to your, uh, now what's the word, uh, subordinates. <laughs> you forget to run it down to your support system. So if you would have communicated your great idea, your great plan to your subordinates, to your support system, you would have had that much better support to execute your plan, which would have made everything better. But because... You an introvert, and sometimes you don't feel like you got to verbalize everything or communicate or whatever. People should just know what it. That's not how shit work. That's not how stuff work. So that'll cause stuff to not turn out as good as it could have. And that will hinder the productivity and the overall growth of the business. In this case, the Lord's business. You understand? So... One of the challenges that you have to face and overcome as an introvert, you have to start being able to communicate more often and more effectively. 
You understand? You can't be in your own head and thinking that you don't have to do this. And that. No, you have to communicate your ideas, your plans, period, in general. You have to communicate for things to work out better for you and the body as a whole. All right? So you, you have to overcome that. You got to learn how to communicate. All right? The next thing, it says, be brave and push yourself. All right? It says, I see a difference as an opportunity for me to position myself as unique. Regardless of a person's introversion or extroversion, it's the relationship with people that matters as a leader. It's the relationship with people that matters as a leader. We all have to learn to push ourselves if we want to grow personally and professionally. For introverts, that means we have to push ourselves into conversations and into situations where we are vulnerable. It's heavy. It's heavy. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Now, this is in a different context per se, but the message is still the same. All right? Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 6. Uh, it says, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. So Jeremiah was, the Lord told Jeremiah that he was going to be a prophet among the nations. And Jeremiah was insecure and inconfident. He didn't feel like he had that capability to, to fulfill what the Lord just told him he was going to fulfill. And the Lord rebuked him for that. Like, no, nah, you're going to do what the hell I just told you you're going to do. Because I'm with you. You understand? So, basically, to be brave and push yourself in this context as an introvert, you may feel like you want to find some type of niche into where you don't have to communicate with people. You don't have to be in conversations that you don't want to be in. But guess what? When you're in a position of leadership, that's what comes with it. When the Lord exalts you to a certain level, that's what comes with it. You got to have certain conversations and be in situations that you don't want to be in. Why? Because you're not laboring for yourself only. <laughs> it ain't about you. It ain't about your preferences. It's certain things that got to happen for the nation, for the body. And if you get put in that position, you will have to push yourself to go through with it. You may not want to do it. You may not feel like doing it. But guess what? You got to do it. And you can do it because the Lord is with you. The Lord put you in that position because he know that you can. The, one of the most heaviest classes I done heard in my seven uh, years and some change in this truth is Deacon Malachi and Deacon Laba New Moon class from Sunday night. The Lord, when you face challenges and certain things that seem like, you know, that you would pray to the Lord to remove, the Lord put those challenges and stuff in your way, not because he wants you to feel um, defeated or feel like you, you know, whatever. He does that because you have potential. You have a strength that you haven't discovered within yourself. But that challenge is what's going to bring it out of you. That trial, that tribulation is what's going to bring out the greatness in you. You understand? As introverts, you may feel like, oh, that's just not my thing. That's not my thing to do this. It's not my thing to do that. But little do you know, you could be great at doing that. You just have to face that fear. You just have to face that challenge. You understand? And once you do, you will see that you, you might be better than most at doing that. What you feel like you can't do or not good at doing. But the Lord will put you in that situation purposely to bring that out of you. What you're trying to suppress within yourself, the Lord will force you to bring it up out of you. But if you're scared, if you're fearful, if you're doubtful, you know, you'll run from it, you'll hide from it. And that'll result in you bugging out, losing the spirit, being defeated, fearful, faint-hearted, whatever. You won't get the kingdom. 
So it, it's a big deal, all right? The next thing to overcome being an introvert, it says practice and plan. Practice and plan. All right, it says interacting with others saps an introvert's energy and or creates anxiety for them. Extensive practice to master the work demands for any given meeting frees up energy needed for the people competent of that meeting. In addition, planning in advance and anticipating how to approach and interact with others will help gain a sense of control and therefore decrease anxiety. In other words, if you a person that don't like, uh, you know, basically conversation within a group or you having to present an idea or whatever, if there's something that causes anxiety within you, then it wouldn't be wise to do those type of things on the fly or to just wing it. Like, I know I got to do this, okay, I'm going to go in there and it's going to go like this or this or whatever. Once you in a whole bunch of people face and everybody focused and looking at you, and focused on your mouth and what's coming out of it, then that changes your equilibrium get thrown off, you get nervous, you get anxious, and you're not able to properly express what it is you're trying to express. So you sh once you prepare and plan, once you get a proper outline and a proper plan of what you're going to say, that builds confidence, it's more basically you setting yourself up to where it'll come out way smoother and it will decrease the anxiety of just having to do it on the fly. All right, and guess what? That's biblical. Sirach so chapter 33 and verse 4. Sirach so chapter 33 and verse 4. It says, Prepare what to say, and so thou shalt be heard. Bind up instruction, and then make answer. So the Bible tells us to prepare what we say before we say it. The Lord says to bind up instruction and then make answers. So before you present something, it's best to have that preparation process. It's best to have that preparation period for you to, you know you've already com constructed and outlined what you're going to do before you do it. So you're more confident in what you're about to do. All right, that's a good thing. That's a that's something that is going to help you overcome that spirit. Once you get in the habit of preparing what you're about to do before you do it and all of that, you will get in the habit of doing it. And it, you won't have that challenge of nervousness and anxiety so much. Or eventually it'll come to the point where you don't have it at all. All right, because you develop that habit of practicing and planning. All right, the next thing, this might be the second biggest thing I say in overcoming the introvert spirit. And it says, avoid the Lone Ranger Syndrome. All right, avoid the Lone Ranger Syndrome. There's an old adage, if you want, if you want it done right, do it yourself. Were these the words of an introvert? Because constant people interaction drains their energy, introverted leaders will instinctively look for ways to fly solo whenever possible. This can backfire. Going solo too often can look like isolation or arrogance. Aim for a healthy balance of solo and teamwork. When you go, uh, when you do it alone, be transparent about your process. So yes, this is facts. Uh, let's get Sirach 10, verse 26. Sirach 10, verse 26. It says, Be not overwise in doing thy business. Overwise means can't nobody tell you nothing. You're not seeking counsel. You're not hearing counsel. You're not getting second opinions. You're not hearing second opinions. You know what you're doing. You got it under control. That's being overwise. The Lord said, don't be overwise in doing your business and boast not thyself in the time of thy distress. Basically, you 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 know, it's getting hard. You got a challenge in your way and it's looking bad, but you know, I got it. You ain't got to worry about me. I got it. I'm going to figure it out. That spirit is not healthy. All right. That can backfire. 
All right, once again, it says that you, it will cause you to look, uh, what does it say? It say it will cause you to, it will look like isolation or arrogance. You know, that's that player fly, that's that method. Nobody need nobody. No, all right? Um, and basically, people don't, people don't like that. People don't like to see that in a leader. People don't like uh, to see a leader that, can that potentially will be their own downfall like okay when you great you great we appreciate that but the when you do this and when you did that and on the way that you that was that was risky that was iffy that eh, i don't know ah you know it's it's not it's not good you know what i'm saying you don't want to fall into that category because then the people and the people really not going to appreciate that. All right, let's go to Luke 16, verse 9. This kind of going to what we read earlier. Now, this kind of like in a different context, too, but it still applies to the thought. Uh, Luke 16, verse 9. It says, And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into ever everlasting habitations. The heavy part about that scripture is it says, uh, when you fail. When you got that spirit, the Lone Ranger Syndrome, you convincing yourself that you can't fail. Like, I got it. I know what I'm going to do. I got it under control. Whatever. The Lord is telling us, you going to fail. <laughs> you go out of times where you unsuccessful. You understand? And with that being said, like we read it early in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, it says, Woe unto him that's alone when he falleth, for he has no one to help him up. When you got that spirit, and that goes back to another thing we went into, you got to have some type of structure in, in relationship, relationship-wise, to where people have your back. And that requires you to communicate with them and work with them on a team level. When you don't do that and you fail, you don't have that safety net. You understand? You don't have those people that's there to lift you up when you fail. You don't fall in that, uh, what did it say, everlasting habitations. You fall into suits. You fall into losses. You fall into potentially losing your position. Uh, like it says, right, 10, 21. Fear the Lord, go up for the attainment of authority, but roughness and pride is the losing thereof. That's the spirit of pride. That long range of syndrome, believe it or not, it's the spirit of pride. It's when you overdo self-confident. It's nothing wrong with being self-confident. That's what self-confident. That's what the Lord wanted for Jeremiah. He said, don't say you a child. You got it. I'm with you. Lord wants you to be self-confident, but when you overly self-confident, that's going to translate into pride, which is the beginning of sin, and the, it would destroy you. It would destroy yourself. All right. So you yeah, you got to get over that spirit. You got to become more of a team player. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Not saying that to do nothing. It's some stuff that's based executed on your own because only you can approach that situation how you're going to approach it or whatnot uh but you don't want to be doing that most of the time because that that can backfire and people don't like to see that in a person all right uh i'm almost through y'all so the next way to overcome being an introvert is get to know others all right get to know others it says, we are, while we all have natural tendencies and preferences, labeling and placing people in boxes can be dangerous. The two greatest skills of successful leaders share the ability to connect and influence. To do this, you need to know yourself and others well and then flex a being sometimes. All right, so what, basically what it's going into, uh, you know when you're an introvert per se, you don't really want to invest energy and time in getting to know people. 
that's not good. All right, because at the end of the day, you have to interact with people. You have to deal with people in order for things to happen, especially when you're in a leadership position. So when you don't take the time to get to know people, again, that can backfire. All right, let's get Sirach chapter 9, verse 14. Sirach chapter 9, verse 14. It says, as near as thou canst, guess at thy neighbor. And consult with the wise. So what does that mean? Um, at the end of the day, you may be dealing with somebody's representative more often than not. Like you you it's really hard to get to a point to where you say you really, really know a person. Because the first thing a person do when you argue with them, like let's say You've been knowing them for five years, but it's on a two or three times a week basis, like Sabbath, New Moons, Ken One on One, whatever. You know what I'm saying? So, cause this get this be getting thrown at me. I ain't gonna lie. You might be watching. You know what you told me, brother. Anyway, uh, you've been around a brother. You may be knowing a person for two, three years. Well, you, as soon as y'all get in an argument or you correct them or you point out something about them, you really don't know me. Like, you don't know me. Like, yeah, you might have said shalom to me a few times, but you don't know me. And guess what? Hey, listen. Especially when you're in a position of a leader, you have to create ways to, to give yourself an opportunity to get to know the people around you, especially the people up under you. Like, you really, you got to get to know them. You know what I'm saying? Because the first thing they're going to do when you correct them or point something out about them is they're going to claim that you don't really know them like that. You understand? So the Bible say, as near as you can, guess at your neighbor. Meaning what? You have to try your best to really learn a person. You understand? Because if you don't, that could, that could be the person that you think is suitable to have around you when you do this or do that. But that might be the Judas. That might be the snake. That might be the gunner. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know? Uh, or, hell, it's a person that you got certain things that you want to do or certain things that you want to uh, enforce that you feel like you don't have anybody with the resources and talents to help you make that happen, not knowing that it's a it's a brother, it's a soldier, it's an officer right there, you know what I'm saying, in your proximity. They, they got the resources, got the tools that can really help you uh, with your idea and your plan, but you haven't gotten to know that person to know that they bring this or that to the table as far as in this truth. You know what I'm saying? So they can backfire in a lot of ways. If you're an introvert, you might have that challenge. You might have that issue. You don't take the time to get to know people because you don't want to spend your energy doing that. But it's profitable to do that because, again, it's not you're not laboring for yourself but for all them that seek learning. That's what's going to work out for the betterment of the nation and the furtherance of this gospel. All right? So you're going to have to do that. you got to do that. you got to get to know people. And with that, you're going to have to make adjust adjustments. You're going to have to, you know what I'm saying, kind of fluctuate your spirit. Some people, you're not going to be able to be as, you know, with a strong personality around him. This person might be more fragile. This person might be more, uh, you know, uh, risky. This, you know, it's you got to you gonna have to make adjustments as well, and that's gonna be uncomfortable for you, but it's for the betterment of everybody else around you. All right. Uh, so this this one right here, this is the most important one. This is the last one that I'm gonna go. I'm gonna deal with. Uh, this says stop laboring, stop labeling yourself as an introvert. So, like I said earlier, me myself, I would fit into the category of it. Per the stuff that we didn't go over and touched on, I deal with a lot of this. 
And this class is for people that deal with a lot of the same things, right? Or the same things. One thing that we must not do is label ourselves as introvert. Don't put that label on yourself. Remember the first scripture that we went over. You're supposed to be renewed in, your, in the spirit of your mind and put on a new man created in holiness and righteousness. So you are a repenting Israelite, meaning you are a prophet under construction. A real prophet, a pure, basically on the road to perfection, a lot of these things don't fit. A lot of these things gonna have to go. You understand? So you don't wanna put that label on yourself because basically you're telling yourself I'm going to get the kingdom as an introvert. Don't think like that. That's, that's dangerous. All right. So it says the first thing I'd recommend is to stop labeling, your, labeling yourself as an introvert. Labeling is dangerous territory and brings with it a lot of baggage that isn't your truth. Focus on the things that are unique about you. Are you detail oriented? Are you a quick study with strong strategic skills? Focus and talk about things that energize you, your skills and your passions. Be yourself. So basically, when you put yourself into this box as an introvert, you setting yourself short. You setting yourself short because you're greater than that. You don't, because basically you're like, yeah, I'm this and yeah, I'm that. So yeah, I can't do this. Like, no, this, no. You setting yourself short. All right, Romans 12 and 2. I'm almost through, y'all. A couple more scriptures. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So don't ever get uh, conformed to any label. That this that this world has put out there for us to follow. Don't don't get conformed to that. You a prophet of the Lord. You a princess of the Lord. You a daughter of Sarah. You a mighty man of God. You a mighty man of valor. You have the potential to be perfect. Thus saith the Lord. So when you put yourself in this box or whatever, it hinders your transformation. It hinders your development into being that mighty man that the Lord know that you got the potential to be. You know that you got the potential to be it because you are faced with these challenges. You have these tendencies that are actually hindrances to your greatness. Therefore, that is proof that the greatness is inside of you because the Lord put them challenges in your way for you to overcome. That makes sense. You know what I'm saying? So don't sell yourself short. No. Your mindset is to, to prove by your actions, by your lifestyle, by your character that you, that you developed by being in this truth, is to prove that this truth is the acceptable, the perfect will of God. You have to be living proof of the, uh, the changing effect that this Bible has, the transformation effect that this Bible has. You have to be proof of that. So if you put yourself in a box, you're, in, you're doing the opposite of that. <laughs> you're saying that the Bible is not able to transform me or change me in this aspect. And that's really, it's, it's kind of evil. All right? William and Solomon 17 and 12. So this, this scripture right here explains the basis of why a lot of people deal with the introvert spirit. Now, this goes into fear and anxiety, but that, that's why a lot of people would label themselves as introverts, because the fear and anxiety that comes with social interaction. All right, Wisdom of Solomon 17 and verse 12, it says, For fear is nothing else but a betraying of the succors which reason offereth. So the word succors means comfort, all right? Um, everybody has their own comfort zone. As an introvert, your comfort zone typically is when you by yourself, when you with yourself, when you in your thoughts, when you, that's your comfort zone, all right? 
Fear is when you betray those accords or you betray your comfort zone. Meaning when you when you in a position when you outside of your comfort zone, that's when fear arrives. That's um and we know that the Lord didn't give us the spirit of fear. So when you are forced to be outside of your comfort zone, that's actually a push for you to overcome that that flaw. That's really what it is. It's it's basically something in your way for you to conquer. And if you don't see it like that, if you if fear and doubt takes uh the victory in that situation, then you'll never overcome that. You'll never become um uh, You'll never reach the potential that you could. You know what I'm saying? So you gotta you gotta keep that in mind. Whenever you feel like you would rather remain in your comfort zone, just know that it's an element of fear in that. And the scriptures say the fearful, the unbelieving, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, gonna have their place in the lake that burning with fire and brimstone. That scripture heavy. You know what I'm saying? So you may be disguising fearfulness with being an introvert. And that's going to hurt you. That's going to hurt you. All right. Last scripture. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18. It's the lamb back, lamb back off that point. 1 John 4 verse 18. It says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. That just encompasses everything that I just said. All right? Um, love is the keeping of God's commandments. It's this truth. That's what's creating a new man out of us, created in righteousness and holiness. Right? So it says, perfect love cast out fear. The true application of these scriptures and the classes that come out, the understanding that comes from the, the anointed men of the Lord, uh the perfect ex the perfect application of all of this would cast out that anxiety, that fear, that doubt that you have within you telling yourself, no, I can't do this. I don't like being around I don't think I can be around these people like, like that or do this or talk in front of people. That's fear. Perfect love will cast that out. When you really apply these scriptures and get into the word of God the way that you need to. That's going to cause you to overcome all of that. It's going to cast it out. It's going to cast out that introvert spirit. And it says, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Meaning, like I was just saying, for the past 15 minutes, you ain't going to reach your full potential in this truth. You're not going to be made perfect. The Lord wants you to be made perfect. That's the will of God. But you're not going to be made perfect. If you have fear within you, if you have, if you don't want to step outside of your comfort zone and overcome these things that you've been conditioned, maybe through trauma or certain negative experience experiences to where you would just rather not, I'd rather not this, I'd rather not that, you won't be made perfect. You won't be made perfect. You know what I'm saying? You're basically holding on to flaws by way of fear you are holding on to flaws by way of fear so listen you an introvert you heard the things that's not really bad about it because it aligns with the scriptures those are qualities that you have happened to obtain naturally because of that introvert spirit which is fine you you don't have an issue with making time to have solitude to pray and meditate you don't have a problem with examining yourself because you are always dwelling on yourself and self-reflecting and things of that nature. You know better than to just trust any and everybody. All that stuff is good stuff, but those it's a back end of those things, all right? You can be bashful. You can miss out on opportunities with people because you don't want to socially uh interact you can be by yourself all the time and defraud yourself with the good experiences that come with people and with the body you know what i'm saying all of those everything has a back end to it you understand so therefore we have to overcome 
those potential disadvantages that come with being an introvert, all right? Because it's, it really just boils down to fear. That's what it is. That's why you are the way that you are. Believe it or not, it's fear. You don't want to step outside that comfort zone, all right? So listen, if you want to be made perfect, you're going to have to face your fears. You're going to have to overcome it. If not, you're not going to be made perfect. All right, so Lord is willing, that was something for y'all to meditate on and help y'all in this walk. Uh, y'all already know by this point, I mean, hell, I make classes really, you know, for myself. That's why when the, the officer told me somebody wanted a class done on that, I was like, all right, that's my next class because I need this, you know, and I know I can't be the only one dealing with this, you know what I'm saying, so... Lord's willing, uh, brothers and sisters that's dealing with this will help you and uh, gave you the, the, the scriptural motivation to start overcoming those potential disadvantages. All right, so with that, Israel, Shalom, Most High Christ. Nation is men leading by example. Nation is family. Nation is community. Nation is children with role models.